major blizzard is raging across the lower Great Lakes with winds of up to 75 miles an hour blowing snow and reducing visibility to near zero. The combined effect of the Arctic temperatures and the strong winds produced wind chill factors between 40 and 60 degrees below zero across the region. Governor Hugh Carey is requesting President Carter to declare Buffalo and Erie County a major disaster area. This is WBEN Radio News. I'm Lou Douglas. A blizzard paralyzes western New York. Motorists are stranded and traffic grinds to a halt. These and other top stories of the hour on WBEN Radio News. Most of the Buffalo area is paralyzed after blizzard conditions whipped through the area shortly before noon today. Strong winds are continuing to whip up blizzard conditions and blowing and drifting snow has produced numerous whiteouts. Traffic has ground to a halt. Numerous traffic accidents are reported all over western New York, and hundreds of motorists have abandoned their automobiles to search for emergency shelter. All Erie County roads are heavily drifted and impassable. Niagara County reports the entire county has been declared in a state of snow emergency. All roads are closed to vehicular traffic except for emergency vehicles. If you are already on the Niagara section of the thruway, Stay in your car. There are people trying to reach you. Police are trying to reach you with snowmobiles and um, with cars and whatever, if they can, they can move, but don't run foot. But don't panic, okay? If you're afraid, it's okay. I Listen, if I was out there, I'd be afraid too. States of emergency have been declared in West Seneca, Hamburg, Eden, and Amherst, and the town of Lancaster for the second day in a row. Niagara, Cattaraugus, and Chautauqua County are also hard hit. Plowing operations on state roads in these areas have been suspended. And our next guest is Erno Rossi, and his book is White Death, the Blizzard of 77. Welcome, sir. Erno, welcome well, thank you to very the much. show. And isn't it true that people remember where they were? Definitely. Death of John Lennon as well. People remember exactly mm -hmm. where they were and who told them. Yeah, it, it, I don't want to be punny, but it freezes a moment in history, this book. Oh. Everyone remembers. I'm sure everybody out there watching now is right, going, Joanne, I was... where were you? Well, I lucked out, okay? I lucked out. I was in Daytona Beach in Florida during that, and I remember a bunch of guys coming down from Buffalo telling us about it, and we're going, yeah, 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 sure, sure. It's just a little, you know, it's just a, you know, snow. Like, don't make such a big deal about it, you know, but then we heard it on the news and thought maybe it is a little bit more than we thought and of course Erno's going to tell us exactly how much yeah. more there was. Well, <laughs> Erno, did all people start out like Joanne says, uh, oh it's just a snowstorm, don't get The know, most alarmed. difficult thing about that storm was convincing people how serious it was. Mm -hmm. it, it was a unique storm. It never happened before and let's hope it never happens again but it was a unique storm. Now, do you have, uh, are there other storms that we've had to compare this with or no, not? Nothing compares nothing to this one. This, this was a winter hurricane. This is far beyond a blizzard. I mean, you had uh, the coldest winter on record with snow every day for a month before this storm. You had Lake Erie freezing over very early in the middle of December. It was frozen over, early freezing record, and nothing, it, Lake Erie's not even thinking of freezing over yet today, and this is the end of January. And all that snow was building up on Lake Erie like a time bomb. It, it, we never had a, a day in which the snow melted. It was below freezing all that time. And I live on the shore of Lake Erie, and I'm watching all this snow build up. And I think, my God, if we ever get a wind, what will happen? Well, on January 28th, it, the wind came out of the uh, southwest for four days, uh, hurricane force, and for the first 24 hours after it hit, it was a whiteout. You could not see your hand in front of your face for the first 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And all that 10,000 square miles of snow blew inland, buried us all along the lake shore and then inland to St. Catharines and even Niagara Falls. Um, and of course, western New York got socked uh, really badly. Well, how, how widespread was this storm? Where did it start and end? Well, it came right across the United States and right across Canada. The high winds did, but they didn't have the, the snow problem of the tent from Buffalo to Detroit. All that snow blew in on us off that lake. Uh, it killed a lot of people out west as it came through. Uh, in Minnesota itself, it killed 20 people in the hotel. They crowded into a hotel to get out of the winds, and, and the hotel was an old wooden hotel. It was jammed full of people, and in the middle of the night, it caught fire. 20 people died just like that. Mm -hmm. uh, here, 30 people died within, within 25 miles of where we're sitting here. Exposure and froze to death in their cars. It was, uh, they got covered over and couldn't do anything about it. They couldn't go anywhere. They're right in the middle of a 
major disaster, the only blizzard ever declared a national disaster. Wow. Mm -hmm. Where did you get white death from? The, the news of that storm went around the world, of course. It got on the wire services, and, and it was reported in the East African newspapers as, the, as a white death that was sweeping all of North America. It was, a, it was a much more regional than that, but I thought, what an interesting title. I thought at first, maybe they're getting even for calling the um, plague that went through medieval Europe the sure. Black Death, you know. <laughs> but here it was, the White Death. When did you decide to write this book? Well, there I was in the, in the middle of it in my living room. I, actually, I was watching Canada geese on the ice in front of my house. I feed them, and they're all eating away, and it was, it was still fairly nice out. And all of a sudden, they just collapsed all under their breast, pulled their legs up, tucked their heads into their backs, and I thought I poisoned them or something uh, because they're all going into this survival, you know, uh, mode. And then I look out on the lake, and there's a huge wall of white coming across the lake, like oh, as high as a mountain. And it, it came across, and it, hit the, it covered the geese, and it hit the house, boom, and I thought it was going to blow in the window on the house. It was so powerful. It didn't, fortunately. A lot of houses it did, and the houses filled up with snow. But anyway, it, it had hit, stayed 24 hours that way. I never saw the geese for three days. And I thought, they're dead. They're finished, you know, the poor things. And on the fourth day, I, there was a break in the storm. And you could see these blobs down there where they had, were still like this. And I thought, they're frozen solid. And I sneaked down close to them and got a picture of them. It's in, it's in the book. And, uh, and then uh, the, everything started to clear up. And as the sun came out on the fourth day, they all stood up. They, they shook their wings. They stretched and they walked around and they practiced a bit, and then they all took off with the Niagara River for some water. That's incredible how they're surviving. A little more adaptable than we are. Yeah, you mentioned pictures, uh, Joanne. We have a mm -hmm. number of them here. Maybe we can put a few of them on the screen for the people to have a look at. And you, uh, I don't know if you take a look at the screen, maybe people, you can tell us what we're looking were, at here. This is excellent insulation once, once it occurs, you know, if you don't die from asphyxiation inside the house. <laughs> but um, yeah, houses were covered, some completely. Dogs were out walking on roofs of houses, urinating on the TV antennas af <laughs> after it hit. And the further away you got from Lake Erie, the less damaging the storm was. But it was a very common sight uh, along the shores of Lake Erie. Yeah. And our next picture is uh, from Wayne Fleet. Now, check this out as a, as a Canadian snow drift. Oh, this is, this is oh, people sorry. going around with the snowmobilers. Yeah. We're going around checking the school buses to see if there were people still and look Stuck where the, the snowmobile is. Yeah, the now, snowmobile is on top of the school bus and all kinds of school buses. Trains disappeared in this one. I mean, they couldn't find wow. trains. Uh, the people on the trains got off and went into farmhouses. This is similar to what happened to Gary, isn't it? When you drove your friend home? Oh, I drove up on the back of a car. Yeah, oh. just a block away from here. Drove up in the black, on the back of a car, never saw it at all. It was just a mound of snow, mm -hmm. and uh, didn't even know it was there. Now, some people, the only way they did survive was is they were covered in their trucks, and they stayed in their truck, and it shut it off, of course, because you get the monoxide sure. poisoning, and it got covered over, and once it was covered over, it was warm in there. Your body heat created, uh, and then in the morning, or within 24 hours, they had snowmobiles going over top of them, and they would poke out with the window cleaner, you know, the yeah. plastic brush, and it would go up above the snow drift, and then someone would grab it up there, and they'd dig down and, and oh dig the goodness. people out of the trucks. It was an amazing <laughs> storm. Well, let's take a look at the next one. Yeah. Here's your hurricane force winds. This is Welland, where uh, planes got flipped over and thrown long distances. Uh, if you went outside and walked, or tried to walk against that wind, uh, you could, you could. I did. I got out of the house on the on the lee side of the house, walked out, turned my back to the storm with my park on it, and I could lay right down into into that wind like this and just and just hold it right there at 70 miles an hour. All right, let's take a look at the one last more. picture yet. Oh, is that the last one right there? All right. There, well, are, there are all kinds of pictures yeah, in here. If you want to see, see more, you buy the book. Yeah, yeah. there's a good 70 pictures in this one. The original edition had 50. This is up to actually close to 80, over 70. And when did you finish this book? This one I finished um, on, in the middle of the summer, and it was printed in October, and it's doing very, very well. So you just updated edition. stories from the original one, and that's right. Uh, and Millennium Edition that yeah. people might want to keep at home, and because it it is the blizzard of the century and the millennium, mm -hmm. and there's nothing ever that came close to it. Give us give us one of the stories from the book. Tell us about one of the people in the book. Well, uh, along the lakeshore, a good example is where. Uh, Two kids were home alone, and uh, and the big bay window did blow in in the house, and and the two kids 
the house was filling up with snow, and they sealed themselves off in the kitchen with their dog and put their sleeping bags in there while the rest of the house filled up. Now, they could still talk on the phone, fortunately, and they were in touch with their mother, who was stuck in a snowdrift halfway to Fort Erie. And um, it, took, it took about 12, 15 hours to get someone to them, and fortunately, someone got through and they did because the kids were on their way out. They were freezing to death. It, w it was that cold. Now, one house where the front door blew in where the people weren't home and the house filled up with snow, the dog was there, uh, and the dog was never permitted to go upstairs. It was never permitted to go on the bed. But here's the house filling up with snow. The pipes are all freezing. They're bursting with water, and the dog went upstairs, got on the bed, dug down through, every, through the mattress, and, and was there, curled up in the mattress uh, five days later when, when they were finally able to get back to their house. The house was a disaster, but the dog got up, wagged his tail, and oh, he was good. just fine. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you have a personal favorite in this book? Myself, well, uh, the, if you want to see frostbite, uh, classic examples of frostbite there where they, there's Alex Mulko, he was a, a Kalmakop brother, he was a wrestler in the 1950s, and he, uh, he had to be, he was 250 pounds, and he had passed out already in his car, it was covered over, and these two uh, fellows from up in, in Waynefleet uh, went out looking for him in the middle of that whiteout and, and saw the aerial on the car and dug down and, and fortunately were able to get him out and drag him and drag him up over the drifts that were uh, starting to cover houses already and, and they, had to, they had to break a window in the house to get him into the house and he recovered uh, consciousness fortunately and he was, his nails eventually fell off from all the bubbling but his, his picture's in there and it was an amazing tale of survival. Now, for the people who don't know, how long were schools and businesses and banks and everything closed? Schools, uh, to, the, to the delight of the kids, were, were closed <laughs> for about a, a week. And, and uh, a lot of those kids, see, we had 2,000 kids stranded in rural in schools. schools yeah. yeah, And that had never happened before. And to the credit of the teachers and all those people that were, were with them, it was, it was a, a very professional tale of taking care of people who were really uh, extremely agitated at times because of the nature of the storm. So schools were closed for a week? Yes. And businesses, did they reopen? or? Eventually, yeah. It took about a week for the businesses to get back into circulation. Uh, it's interesting with a blizzard because it's difficult to get help into people who are experiencing a blizzard. Any other type of disaster, you can get help in, you know, but with a blizzard, you until it's over. Sure. There must have been a lot of like elderly people. That's and right. If, uh, if you're, if you're nine months pregnant, so if you're nine months pregnant and uh, waiting to go to the hospital and something. And, like and that, that was an interesting statistic I came up with because I found something <laughs> that uh, Canadians were better at than Americans because I wondered how it affected the birth rate nine months later. Mm -hmm. Right here in, in regional Niagara, it jumped 18 percent the birth rate mm -hmm. nine months after the blizzard. In Western New York, is only three percent jump. So we're better at something than uh, the <laughs> Americans. They, they other spend than, more time shoveling snow or something. <laughs> sure, by all means. Other yeah. than healthcare and hockey, we, you know, we got something else to brag about. <laughs> Where's uh, this book available? Yeah. Oh, it, here in, in Canada, Coles and Chapters handles it. In the States, Barnes and Nobles or Borders or Walden Books. Yeah, it's it's well distributed and selling well. It, very well. I'm really happy with the results. Really, really happy. And there's is there another book coming out from Erno Rossi? Well, I'm doing my memoirs right now. That should be ready within the year, and it, it deals with this area in Western New York. Yeah, you know? it's I call it "Thank You, Mrs. America." My my mother was an American born in in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, and she guided us along, myself and my four brothers, uh, because we lost our dad when he was very very young to Lou Gehrig's disease, mm -hmm. and uh, we've had a very interesting life. Uh, up to now. <laughs> Punxsutawney, we should have had you here in February. That's right. Yeah. We're Punxsutawney Phil. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Okay, well, thank you very much, Ernest. Well, for thank being you for here. having Thanks me. Thanks for bringing us. I you guess brought back make a lot, lot of people. Well, think, yeah, yeah, a lot of memories. And yeah. uh, I knew, you know, half a dozen people in your book and uh, stories of Attila and uh, um, Stan Pettit and people like that that I know and I'm reading. Right away, right. I went to it and I read those parts to see what you know what they were doing and, and the sabers, and, you know how yeah. they ex went through a, an of, unusual experience. You yeah, could probably make saber. another book by having everybody write well, it and see, tell their little Everybody right story now at home it. knows exactly where they were when that blizzard hit, if they were in the Niagara region. Yeah, I almost feel the, guilty that I was sitting by on the Florida. beach. You were in the right place. Missed all that for three weeks. <laughs> Well, it's kind of strange. Uh, we had a little snowstorm just the night before the blizzard hit, and it had knocked out the power at my kid's school.
so the kids didn't get to go to school that day. They all stayed home and we lived out in the country. So all the kids got, except mine, got sent to a house across the street and four of us ladies decided to go to Dutler's big new open house in St. Catharines. And we didn't make it back for three days. Where did you stay? We ended up at a house in North Pelham that once upon a time had been a grocery store and gas station. And because of all the trouble we had trying to get back from St. Catharines, we stopped there figuring that we'd get some milk and some bread in case the snowstorm stayed overnight. And uh, we pulled in there and there was a busload of kids. The bus was stuck in a drift outside. We thought it was just sitting there. And two cars that had gone off into the ditches on the only other way that we could have headed out. And uh, there were people there from there. And before the day was over, there were 39 of us stuck there. And we all spent the night in the house next door. Okay, and now where were you on the blizzard of 77? We were actually right on the lake shore um, in Waynefleet. And uh, we were in a home, and I had a store right next door. And um, I was there along with my five children. My husband at the time was in the hospital. And I had myself and my five children were alone in the house. And the snow started, and there was no way we could have got out. Um, you talk about them coming and get you in a helicopter. What ha how did that transpire? Like what? Well, it happened, um, I, ha I had to call Sea How because I had no food in the house. I had very little food in the house, like after this started. And I was in there for five days with my five children, which was ranging from the age of six to 14. And I had no food and I didn't have any, my pipes, my, my water pipes broke. So I had no water. I had no toilet that would flush because my pipes were all, all broken. Winter of 77 has been tough all over. It even snowed in Miami. But the winter's heaviest blows have fallen in western New York State, and the biggest blast of all hit on Friday, January 28th. Buffalo, Lackawanna, and other Lake Erie communities had their worst blizzard in history. 17 hours of 60 mile per hour winds, sub-zero temperatures, and blinding snow. Four more days of storms followed. When it was over, western New York was a major disaster area buried in 20-foot snowdrifts. And through it all, Bethlehem employees struggled to save the Lackawanna plant. Conditions were, were very bad. Uh, you couldn't see, uh, at least 10 feet in front of you, you couldn't see anything. It was cold, gee, and you couldn't see nothing and blowing. It was a blizzard. Uh, it was a wall of white snow. You couldn't see anything. Uh, you couldn't survive five minutes in the conditions that we operated in. People were scared. Uh, you could walk 50 yards in that blizzard and be afraid not to get back where you started from, even if you knew where you were. You couldn't see an arm's length away from you. And the wind was so cold that if you didn't have something over your mouth, your mouth and your nose would freeze shut. Hundreds of Bethlehem employees fought the blizzard of 77 at the Lackawanna plant. Some were there when the storm hit and didn't get home for days. They worked double and triple shifts, grabbed a nap, and came back for more. They fought to save their plant and their jobs. Railroad, steel making, people from the mills that are normally considered uh, high paying, high class jobs were out with shovels and picks opening switches up because they knew that if we didn't get the primary side started, they were out of a job like everybody else was. And if this place would have gone down, you wouldn't have dug it out till spring. The key to keeping the plant going was its gas supply, plus the coke ovens and blast furnaces. Without an adequate gas supply, the coke ovens and blast furnaces could have gone down with disastrous results. Well, our, our gas pressure was critical on several occasions at the coke ovens and at the blast furnaces. If we had lost the gas systems, we could have seriously damaged the coke ovens 
and we could have had our three blast furnaces offline. Losing the blast furnaces would have resulted in at least two blast furnace relines, which would have taken six to eight months. Uh, damage to the coke ovens could have been virtually irreparable, short of completely rebuilding a battery. With no coke ovens to fuel the blast furnaces and no blast furnaces to make iron, there would have been no steel made at the Lackawanna plant and no jobs for 11,000 employees. At the coke ovens, it was a vicious circle. The ovens demand gas for underfiring to keep the batteries hot. But they provide most of the gas themselves through their normal operations of turning coal into coke. And the blizzard had slowed operations to the point where the ovens could barely generate the gas they needed to survive. We had high winds uh, up to 60 miles an hour. We had low temperatures. The temperature fell from my, uh, about 28 degrees down to four above. And we had very heavy snow, very heavy blizzard conditions. We can operate uh, fairly well with any one of these conditions, but the combination of all three was made the operation impossible. Coke oven equipment was stalled in place by ice and drifted snow. When the equipment doesn't run, the hot coke doesn't get pushed out of the ovens, no coal is charged into the ovens, and no gas is produced. All the employees, hourly and supervisory, did an incredible job. They never uh, stopped trying, they never quit. Uh, they kept trying to get the machines running. Well, in a way of speaking, I kind of enjoyed it. I kind of enjoyed it. There's quite a few of the guys out here, and they had us food, coffee, We'd take breaks, or something was breaking down, we'd grab some salt, put on the tracks, get the machines and things going. Sometime they wouldn't go, we'd be back in the lunch room, which was warm, and I kind of enjoyed it. They managed to get just enough coke pushed and ovens charged so that we never did uh, run out of gas. Every little bit of coke oven gas and blast furnace gas was crucial to the fuel department, which worked hand in hand with the coke oven and blast furnace departments to balance the critical gas pressure. A natural gas shortage had cut the plant's allocation by 50%, making the fuel department's job even tougher. The problem that we have here, uh, we have combustible mixtures in the gas systems in these two operating departments. And if air is allowed to enter into these systems, we would have uh, severe explosions that would cripple the plant for some time to come and result in costly repairs and that type of thing. The blast furnace department had been fighting an up and down battle against snowstorms throughout the month of January. They were trying to get back up to a full three furnace operation when the big one hit. And the big one put us flat down in a matter of an hour and a half. All furnaces off, boilers sealed off. We ended up with three furnaces flat down on fan, all the boilers sealed off. Uh, no way to get to the pits, no way to get to the BOF. We trapped nine or ten ladles full of iron somewhere between here in the BOF and here in the pit. It just sat there and froze solid. The storm was so sudden and so severe that the blast furnace department couldn't bank the furnaces to shut them down. At the same time, the storm blocked railroad tracks and froze switches. Ladle cars full of molten iron couldn't get from the blast furnace to the BOF or to the pits near the lake where hot metal could be dumped on the ground and reclaimed later. The furnaces were fanned with just enough blast to maintain a slight pressure inside the furnaces, maintain the gas system, and keep from chilling the hearth. The furnaces, some furnaces had fanned for 33 to 36 hours, which is uh, about 25 to 30 hours more than you'd have liked to fan them. We had no idea what harm we were doing to the furnaces and whether we'd be able to bring them on or not. But we had to try. Uh, we couldn't do any worse than shutting the place down that was already shut down. Furnaces have come out of it relatively good. We lucked out on that one, too. There was a lot of luck, a lot of hard work by everybody. Foremen, men, women. We even had women in here. We had one woman trapped in here for about uh, 
30 hours as he worked down the ore dock cleaning switches, salt and rails. So there was, at that time, there was no salary, hourly, union, non-union. Everybody was just out here busting their hump. The plant services department bore the brunt of the snow removal effort. In the emergency, roads and parking lots became unimportant. The main thing was to protect the plant's primary operations. One of the critical pieces of track led to the beach, to the pits where the blast furnace iron could be dumped if it couldn't go to the BOF. We knew that the ability of the blast furnaces to continue operating depended on our ability to keep this track open so that they could bring their subladles to the beach. The BOF was completely out of business and wasn't accepting any iron at all. And so we knew how vitally important this was, and when the storm came back on Sunday afternoon, uh, we had gotten to the point where our bulldozer going up and down the track just couldn't, couldn't push the snow any further. There was no place for the snow to go. So at that point, we said, we've got to send in a front-end loader, a rubber-tired loader. And when we got the thing in there, he got stuck. And so we sent a bulldozer in to rescue the loader, and then we sent a second bulldozer to rescue the loader and the first bulldozer. And by the time we got done on Sunday afternoon and evening, we had had five pieces of equipment up here to, to try and get the stuck stuff out. We had uh, eight people all together up in here under these wild conditions. Of course, by then it was dark, and we were really discouraged. Well, uh, at the beginning, we were worried about our personal safety. But once you get into a job of that type and the dangers is involved, you forget about your personal safety, see? The only thing you think about then is to accomplish what you've been sent out to do. And you worry about that when you get back. <laughs> well, we got the track opened, uh, but it was a battle because it kept drifting in. We had to keep machines on it continuously just to keep this, this one particular track open. During the height of the blizzard, there were over 700 employees and storm refugees trapped in the plant's main office, plus over 2,000 employees in the plant itself working to save it. All of these people had to be fed, but the concession that normally supplies the in-plant restaurants was out of food. They did the best they could. They used up all the food they had, and they started getting food in. The following morning, we got a four-wheel drive Jeep Got permission from uh, management to go out and get food if we could get it. We stopped off at McDonald's and ordered 150 Egg McMuffins and 200 Big Macs. And we fed our people that morning with those, with that food. Meanwhile, the plant's general services division geared up to take on the feeding chores. The kitchen crew in the plant office normally handles just the cafeteria and dining rooms in that building. But during the storm, the crew prepared food for distribution throughout the plant. It was taken into the plant by four-wheel drive vehicle and snowmobile. Well, in the beginning, it started with sandwiches, and then uh, we were trying to get them hot food over there. They were getting sort of thicker ham and cheese and cold cuts, and, and we had desserts. We had uh, canned fruits we shipped over to them, soups, juices. We had any number of volunteers. People throughout the building here were, uh, had some supervisors, superintendents, washing pots and pans, peeling vegetables. Some volunteers got to try out special recipes. Special recipe is lining up the bread on the counter, <laughs> slapping on the mustard and putting the uh, Swiss cheese and ham together, wrapping them up. To some employees, medicine was just as important as food. The plant medical and environmental control departments helped out. People uh, called the clinic uh, and told us what their needs were, uh, what medications they were on, and uh, if they didn't know, we asked them to check with their doctor to find out what the medications were that they were getting. And once they identified what they needed, we uh, tried to furnish it. First of all, we went to OLV Hospital and picked up the medication, brought it back here to the clinic where it was put into envelopes, and then Bob and I delivered it out through the plant. Well, in some locations, uh, it was almost impossible. Uh, we went as far as we could uh, with the, the four-wheel drive, and, and in the few instances, we had to walk them in, and, and others, we even had uh, heavy equipment take it in from, uh, from the gate, uh, such as a payloader. 
Well, I think one of the things that could happen uh, but did not happen here was that uh, after working long hours uh, under adverse conditions, people become fatigued. And when they're that fatigued, one expects uh, a rash of uh, serious accidents. Very fortunately, this didn't happen. But what did happen during those long, fatiguing hours under adverse conditions was worth it. Quite simply, the plant was saved. It's impossible to show even a fraction of the people and departments who worked through the storm and afterwards. But as individuals and as a team, they were successful. They kept the coke ovens, blast furnaces, gas supply, and themselves intact through the snow emergency. And when the weather eased, they brought the plant's production facilities back online. We came very nearly losing the plant. Our gas systems on the coke ovens and the blast furnaces were critical. But we made it, and I can't say enough for the individual effort of our employees and our supervisors. And the cooperation and teamwork of the South Buffalo Railroad, the fuel department, plant services, and our mechanical and electrical forces, and the balance of the departments in supporting our coke ovens, blast furnaces, and steel making was really remarkable. We're back to normal this week as far as the plant's concerned. We're ready for the next storm, but we're really looking for an early spring. And yes, it is bad out there, both on the road and off. Eerily, this storm comes almost exactly 27 years after one of the worst winter storms on record. The blizzard of January 1977 raged for four days through Ontario's Niagara region and western New York. Hurricane force winds blew 10,000 square miles of snow off Lake Erie. And when it was all over, 30 people were dead. It was a blizzard the locals still call the White Death. Small communities along Lake Erie look like ghost towns. Trucks and cars are abandoned all over the place. The blizzard of 77 started a month before it actually occurred, in the sense that we had one of the coldest winters on record. We had a snow buildup on the 10,000 square miles of frozen Lake Erie, and we didn't have a day of thaw before Friday, January 28, 1977. Then an unusual thing occurred on that day, around 10.30 in the morning and for four subsequent days, we had hurricane force winds come out of the southwest and clean 10,000 square miles of snow off the surface of Lake Erie. This meant that all the surrounding communities acted as giant snow fences for all this snow. People were caught unawares because it was such a cold winter to begin with. It was snowing every day, and all you'd hear, there's going to be more snow. And people would say, oh, more snow. And it's going to be another storm. Oh, well, yeah, so what? And they'd go on with their life. Well, during the whole four days, I think only eight to ten inches of snow fell from the sky. The rest was already here and uh, acting like a bomb, ready to explode. And when Friday, January 28th came along, it exploded and exploded and exploded for four succeeding days. I was in the living room here looking out on the surface of the lake and there was about 14 Canada geese picking away at the corn that I had left for them on the ice. And I noticed that they all collapsed onto their breasts and pulled their legs up into their bodies and tucked their heads back down into their back feathers. It's a survival mode. And then I see this huge wall of white coming across the lake. It was like a, a desert sandstorm that went way up into the sky. And this wall of white came across the bay covered the geese and then boom into the into the house hit the windows there almost blew them in and it blew a lot of windows in on a lot of houses and filled a lot of houses up with snow back in 1977 i was at this school so i've been here 32 years now and we were watching out of the window but we couldn't see anything in the back of the soccer post nothing was visible so we knew at that stage that we had to get out we actually debated whether we should even leave uh, once we got out to the car. But I had to get back because I was worried that my water pipes would freeze and burst. 
So I said to Bill Marshall, I said, Bill, I'm, I'm heading home. So he said, well, he'd like to go home as well. So that's why we took some of the students with us in that direction. It probably took us a good hour to get maybe a half a mile. And we dropped the students off at their houses. We had to leave the car at, at that point. We couldn't take the car any further. And we went in snow that was up to our knees to the final uh, stretch to Bill Marshall's house. So when we got there, um, Bill and his wife right away said, okay, Attila, you're staying here, you can't go any further. And I said, no, I have to get home. Yeah, let's go and see what the kids are up to. It was just an ordinary morning, we started out. And it started to snow just a little bit, but, you know, nothing bad, really. So we went, and we had a whole list of groceries to get, so we went to groceries and loaded it up and uh, went home. Oh, a good pack of snow this time. It was snowing hard, and we just didn't realize how bad it was going to get. And it got really bad really fast. At one point, I couldn't see the front of my truck anymore. And it was a white pickup truck, and I couldn't see the front end of the hood anymore. It was time to stop. Some people thought it was the end of the world, you know, because it went on for so long. People couldn't get home to their houses for a week. And when they did get there, the houses were filled up with snow, the windows had blown in, the pipes had frozen, the water was all over, frozen. It was, it was a second major disaster when they got back to their homes. You couldn't see a thing. The visibility was just zero. It was blowing in my eyes. It was freezing around my eyes, around my nose. Only on movies had I seen snow like that. You know, I couldn't imagine walking where I took a step and the snow went right up, up to my waist. And I had to kind of lift my leg out and then my other leg up and try to get that. And so that's what it was. At times it was better to crawl. This was the worst part of my journey. I lost track of the houses and I ended up walking out onto the lake. And of course on the lake, I didn't know in which direction to go. If I kept on heading in the wrong direction, I'd end up going to open water and I'd be finished out there. So. With that fear, uh, luckily I was able to find the road again, but uh, I thought to myself at that point when I was on the lake that uh, the graveyard isn't too far from here, so that would be my final resting place. It's hard to describe really how a person feels when you get little by little covered in the snow. The exhaust got covered and we got sick because the exhaust fumes turned, got back. But little by little, we couldn't open the doors anymore because the snow was up against them. Pretty soon, we couldn't look out the side windows anymore or the front window. And little by little, this whole thing got covered over. And here we were, just like in an egg loop. You're going to go in there, Lynn? Okay. I didn't know if we'd get out of there because the okay. snow just kept falling heavier and heavier. But at a certain point, you think all you can do is, is wait and see. If there's nothing you can do, you stop being scared because it doesn't really help. And we said a few prayers and, well, I did kind of quietly and you just think, well, if you're meant to get out of there, you're meant to get out of there. If you're not, you're not. I suddenly saw something black uh, in the distance and I realized it was a tree. So I followed again, went by the graveyard, I finally made it back to my house and, you know, here I'm so exhausted and excited finally to find my place. And I looked at, at the house and uh, there was no way to get into the house. The snow was right up to the second uh, floor. So I had to dig by hand. I dug a tunnel through the side and I found my window and I kind of broke through the window and fell in and uh, it was quite a trek. Early in the morning, at about nine o'clock, we heard somebody walking across the top of the truck and I had this snow scraper with us so I cracked the window down and up through the window and up through the snow and I guess it must have been sticking out just a little bit maybe like that and I, I kept pushing it up and down and here this man he had already walked away and he, he, he says after I talked to him he says I don't know what made me turn around and look again and he says here was the thing going up and down and of course, he went back and, and tugged on it, so then we knew we had contact, and you know, we were sort of, little cheer went up inside, and first thing you know, we heard shovel scraping on the truck. And, and then the policeman came, and I have never seen bigger, handsomer men in my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> it was the next day, and I took this, the old Super 8 camera, um, 
in, in daylight, it was even more stunning what you saw out there. There was no road. Uh, all you saw was snowmobiles flying by. The kids saw it was great, you know, for them. Oh, look at all the snow. They wanted to keep sliding down from the top of the pole, and it, for them, it was fun. Snowmobilers were performing desperate acts to, to get to people and should really be complimented because they did save a lot of lives. It was just something you would do if you had a snowmobile because a lot of people didn't get out of their homes. They couldn't get out of their homes. They were snowed in and uh, they needed groceries. Like, I don't know how many trips a group of us made to low banks to deliver groceries because they were socked in as badly as we were. Some people had the nerve to have phone and ask someone to pick up a case of beer or a bottle of liquor. And uh, it was not an emergency, I don't think. But food, yes. Southern Niagara and Western New York got the full brunt of it. Within a 30-mile radius of where I'm sitting right now, 30 people died. And uh, most of them died in, in their cars, uh, when their cars stalled out and they couldn't keep them running. Some people tried to get out of their cars and walk to safety, but they couldn't see where they were going. They ended up in the middle of a field, and they found them sometimes months later. Later on, you look back and you realize how dangerous that really was. And, and really how foolish when you think about it. So what if my water pipes had broken? You know, it, it's not worth risking my, risking my life over. When I was doing my research, though, so there's a lighter side to this. I started to interview snowmobilers who were helping people, and I asked them what were some unusual requests you received. And they said, well, bird seed and birth control pills, they said, it was, it was a big big one other than the, the basics and I, uh, bird seed I can understand because birders uh, want to feed their birds you, because they can't get out for feed and then I start wondering about this birth control stuff and and wondered how that would affect the birth rate nine months later and so I, I contacted the people who keep that data here in Niagara and they were amazed to find out that nine months after the blizzard of 77 there was a 18 percent jump in the birth rate. So people were very busy at things other than shoveling snow during that event. Erie County was a comparable area in Buffalo and I checked with their birth rate and they only had a three percent rise versus an 18 percent rise here and I said wow Canadians are better at something other than healthcare and hockey. Immediately thereafter, for about the first three or four years, every time you had a couple snowflakes starting to fall, uh, there was a massive rush to the beer stores, to the liquor stores, to the grocery stores. Everything got cleaned out. Uh, people didn't want to get caught again short. I always carry an emergency box in my car. I have an extra coat, hat, mittens, a candle, a cup to melt snow in case I need something to drink, and chocolate bars, just in case I ever get stuck again. Wind is west at 55, gusting to 63 miles per hour. Winds are what I remember most from the blizzard of 77 because they were howling, screeching, incessant winds. I mean, you could practically hear the nails in your house trying to pull apart. The weather does predict what you're going to do. I went to work on a Friday and I didn't get home for about two weeks. As the weather, weather uh, calls the shots. There's only one way for Buffalo to welcome in a, a good snowstorm. And WGR News Radio 55 was Actually, there. I'm optimistic. I don't think it's going to come, but they say it's going to come. So we have to go with the weatherman says. WGR 55 team coverage got you to work. On you got the two tracks for your tires in both planes. And on Breakfast with Bowerly. Okay, this is your chance to vent your spleen again. You talked about the oh, snow. When he gives you a truck, I got a laborer for you. He'll meet you right at Precious and on Buffalo's official winter weather station, WGR. If it starts to come a little heavier, everything we have will be on the street. In a snow white gown. Seven, eight, yes, nine, we're right now, Eldridge has seven. Brought in seven additional crews, so now they're up to about 33. Now Exclusively on Buffalo's official winter weather station. The manager of a radio station I used to work at, from the day of the blizzard onward, always kept seven clean pair of underwear in his office, because during the blizzard, he went one week wearing the same pair.
five that New York State Electric and Gas was able to contract for last week. Industrial customers have already been curtailed through Tuesday. Residential customers are being asked to make hard, I'm sorry, residential customers are being asked to make hard conservation efforts by setting their thermostats at 65 degrees during the day and 55 degrees at night. Cooperation by all classes of customers is imperative at this time. And do not use your telephone today or tonight to chit-chat. The telephone company urges those people whose calls are of a strictly social nature to stay off the line so the calls of a medical nature and emergencies can get through. If you must make a call, we ask that you keep it as short as possible. If you do not get dial tone immediately after picking up the receiver, please stay on the line. Do not hang up. You will probably get dial tone after several seconds. And you certainly stand a better chance of getting dialed on than if you hang up and start all over again on a new call. Again, the phone company is urging all callers to postpone conversations. They're not of an urgent nature, so that emergency calls can get through. States of emergency have been declared in West Seneca, Hamburg, Eden, and Amherst, and the town of Lancaster for the second day in a row. Niagara, Cattaraugus, and Chautauqua County are also hard hit. Plowing operations on state roads in these areas have been suspended. Governor Hugh Carey had ordered the National Guard into the city to help harried city and county snowplow crews clean our streets. Five high-lift guard trucks were airlifted into our area this morning, but even before the storm hit, the guard said it would not start working until Monday. Lackawanna Mayor Kuwick called KB News this afternoon to give us this piece of information. Streets in the city are closed. I also like to add to that that in case there is a motorist that is stranded, we advise him to go to the nearest home and call the Lackawanna Police Department, and we'll send someone to pick them up and take them to a place to stay for the night. And we've just received word uh, that uh, Genesee and Dick Road in Chicktawaga is completely blocked. They haven't moved for quite some time. This is KB News at 15 before 5. It's 1 below 0 in our good city, and the wind chill factor is minus 54. AccuWeather says this is what's coming up. The blizzard will continue through tomorrow. The low tonight, 10 below zero. In Ohio, the State Disaster Service Agency is drawing up contingency plans to ca in case whole cities run out of natural gas. Governor James Rhodes is urging Ohioans to get off the streets and highways as soon as possible. And one final item, 22-year-old TV star Freddie Prinze is in critical condition at UCLA Medical Center. Prinze shot himself in the head. The exclusive WKBW AccuWeather forecast, blizzard conditions tonight with snow flurries and snow squalls resulting in heavy accumulations mainly south of the city. Extremely strong winds will gust over 50 miles per hour and will cause severe blowing and drifting snow as temperatures drop to 10 to below zero by morning. The wind chill readings will reach 60 below zero. For tomorrow, continue very windy and extremely cold with snow flurries, snow squalls, blowing snow and drifting snow. There will be little change on Sunday. Temperatures tomorrow will be mainly below zero. The high on Sunday, five above. For AccuWeather, this is meteorologist Ray Bang. Buffalo temperature is one below zero. The wind chill factor minus 54. At six before five, I'm Henry Brock, KB Radio News. This afternoon as we lost power to both our downtown studios and Creek Road transmitter site. We have been unable to broadcasting through our normally used transmitter. We do, however, have an emergency transmitter and the staff that we are talking to with now. The best sentence that's ever been constructed. Incidentally, we have that at full power, which is ordinarily reserved for what we got. And this is cool. Now, if you're in your car right now, listen carefully to me if you are in your car right now. First of all, the New York State Thruway is closed from Syracuse to the Pennsylvania State Line, which means any attempt to get on the Niagara section of the Thruway will meet with complete futility. You will be stuck for the night if you try to get on the Niagara uh, section of the thruway. If you are already on the Niagara section of the thruway, 
stay in your car. There are people trying to reach you. Police are trying to reach you with snowmobiles and um, with cars and whatever if they can if they can move. But don't or on foot. But don't panic. Okay. If you're afraid, it's okay. I listen. If I was out there, I'd be afraid too. Being afraid is a normal human emotion. Being panicky is not a normal human emotion, and it's something that you can control. And uh, if everybody panics, there's going to be some serious problems, and um, maybe some people aren't going to come back. So the best thing to do is just sit there, compose yourself, and relax. There are people on the job. It may look pretty pretty bleak right now. If you're going to leave your motor running, make sure that you watch out for carbon monoxide poisoning. Uh, leave your window open a crack to get some fresh air in. If you feel tired or, uh, or nauseous or you smell exhaust gases, open your window. Um, but just relax. And uh, there are people whose job it is to get to you. It's going to take a while. You're going to be out there for a while. It's going to be a story you're going to tell your, your grandchildren, but you're going to make it. Operations will resume. All skilled trades and material department employees who have been scheduled to work on Saturday are asked to report, if at all possible. Okay, it's 5 o'clock, 93 WBEN, Buffalo. This is WBEN Radio News. I'm Lou Douglas. A blizzard paralyzes western New York. Motorists are stranded and traffic grinds to a halt. And the Senate begins debate on natural gas emergency legislation. These and other top stories of the hour on WBEN Radio News. Most of the Buffalo area is paralyzed after blizzard conditions whipped through the area shortly before noon today. Strong winds are continuing to whip up blizzard conditions and blowing and drifting snow has produced numerous whiteouts. Traffic has ground to a halt. Numerous traffic accidents are reported all over western New York and hundreds of motorists have abandoned their automobiles to search for emergency shelter. Grand Island at this time continues to be marooned with both the north and south bridges closed down. Motorists at this time are stranded on the bridges in their cars. Also, the New York State Thruway has been shut down from Syracuse to the Pennsylvania State Line, as well as the entire Niagara section of the New York State Thruway. Fire halls and police stations throughout the area are offering refuge to stranded motorists, and authorities are urging residents to open up their doors to helpless travelers. Numerous suburban areas around Buffalo have declared snow emergencies. The heavy snowfall appears to be over as far as the storm is concerned right now, but the Buffalo meteorologist George Parrish says the problems resulting from it will continue. Well, it actually, it's not even snowing now. There's no snow falling from the sky. It's all blowing, all snow that fell and blowing around. The problem is the high winds. How high are the winds? Well, we've had gusts to 65 miles an hour at Buffalo Airport, Niagara Falls has had gusts to 75 miles an hour. We're expecting them to abate sometime after midnight, but they will remain strong through the weekend. The official Buffalo temperature has edged below zero and will remain near that mark through Sunday. Efforts to clear the snow-clogged streets of Buffalo have virtually ground to a halt. The streets commissioner, James Lindner, reports the situation as serious. So we're at a standstill. Well, we've got a monumental traffic jam throughout the city. Uh, ostensibly, all the merchants downtown and all the business managers allowed their people to go home at the same time, it appears. Uh, we've got people in the street, uh, but they're not really accomplishing what we'd like them to do. Right now, we have the Department of Transportation uh, in the garage servicing their equipment. My second trick is in the garage servicing their equipment. And we're not going out to list of size because, at least until the traffic's down, because we can't do anything. Mr. Lindner says the National Guard is still scheduled to begin assisting the state and city plowing crews on Monday. Attempts to airlift the first National Guard equipment into Buffalo today failed when the weather forced the plane to divert from Niagara Falls to Schenectady. All around Buffalo, workers have been stranded in their places of business because of the storm. One stranded worker at the Thruway Plaza in the town of Cheektowaga, Bert Wagner, tells WBEN Radio News. The Thruway Plaza is snowed right in. We see, we cannot get up on Broadway, or we can't get over to Walden, can't get to Harlem. So there's going to be a lot of people staying here, at least uh, until the storm uh, lets up a little bit. So if anyone is worried about their people or that work out this way, they should know they're here at the plaza. Stranded worker Bert Wagner. Among those marooned by the storm was WBEN reporter Marty Gleason, who telephoned from the Cheektowaga Highway garage on Union Road. 
Marty talked to another person removed there, Isabel Bodner of Williamsville, an employee of American Standard. I left the office at a quarter to one, and I've been here since three o'clock. And I want to uh, express my appreciation to the superintendent of the highway department who sent the men out to the car to guide us back here. They're serving us coffee, and, and it's just wonderful. What kind of storm has this been for you? It's the worst that I can remember. I was never stranded before in my life. Isabel Bodner of Williamsville. Meanwhile, at the Greater Buffalo International Airport, no flights are coming in or out at this hour since visibility is near zero. And this just in, the New York State Thruway has now been closed from Amsterdam, 30 miles west of Albany, to the Pennsylvania State Line. The Thruway Authority says that blowing and drifting snow has forced the closing of the superhighway. Now a 323-mile stretch of the Thruway is closed down. The Niagara Mohawk Power Corporation reports that 5,000 customers over a wide area of the Niagara frontier in Genesee County are now without power. All crews are out and attempting to get to the problem areas. The utility asks that only customers without electric service call. All other calls should be held off until the first of the week. New York telephone company officials are urging area residents to avoid using the telephone for social calls. Spokesman James Rhodes said that the phones should be used for emergencies only until the storm abates. New York State Electric and Gas in Lockport is appealing to all commercial and public customers in Erie, Niagara County, and Orleans County to further curtail the use of natural gas. New York State Electric and Gas has requested that natural gas consumption be reduced to a minimum of 50 percent. The latest problem developed after the Brooklyn Union Gas Company canceled a contract for gas they planned on supplying to New York State Electric and Gas. Brooklyn Union claims they now need the fuel for their own purposes. WBEN News Time, six minutes past five o'clock. At Pavilion, some buses are out returning children to their homes. They say the conditions aren't as bad in Pavilion as elsewhere. Other children are being held at the school. Pavilion is also described as okay. Taking a look at road conditions, city police ask that there be no driving at all. The police want you to stay where you are. The streets are in, quote, miserable condition. Who's stranded in the area. There are 60 cars stalled at the William and Fillmore area. Stay away from that. Uh, let's see, all seven a and stores will be closed tomorrow. And uh, the New York State Thruway between Amsterdam and the Pennsylvania line. The New York State Thruway, in other words, our Thruway, for everybody who can hear my voice right now, for all intents and purposes, the Thruway is closed. The New York State Thruway is closed. Now, here's the important part. The Niagara section is closed. The state police have reported that along the Niagara section, there may be entrances that look like you can get on it, and get away with it. The fact is, you cannot. If you get on the Niagara section of the thruway, pal, you're on it for the duration, because you are not going to get off. Now, those of you who are on the Niagara thruway, or section of the thruway right now, state troopers and other law officers are attempting to rescue you, and they will. Uh, there are some injured motorists. They're going to help them first. Uh, all I can tell you is, if you are stranded in your car, remain calm. If you let yourself panic, there's a chance you could get killed out there. Um, and I don't want to make you panic, but that's the truth. So the thing to do is uh, to arrest your fear. It's normal to be afraid. Don't worry about that. I'd be afraid if I was out there too. I'm here and I'm afraid. I might look outside that window and go, yay. But look, just relax, okay? There are people out there. They are, their job is to get to you and to rescue you, and it's going to happen, okay? You're going to be all right. Just relax. Make sure you don't, if you feel like you, you're smelling carbon monoxide, fuel, well, carbon monoxide doesn't have a smell, but it usually comes along with other automotive fumes. So if you start smelling fumes, make sure you open your window, get some fresh air in there. Watch out for that. Watch out for frostbite. Keep your radio on KB and relax. 
because we're going to get you out of there. Just relax. The entire town of Cheektowaga is shut down. And, <laughs> well, the entire town of Cheektowaga has been shut down for years. Uh, no, the entire town of Cheektowaga is shut down and isolated by the storm. All residents of western New York must, repeat, must stay indoors. That's, that's it. Nobody is allowed out unless it's an emergency. Okay? And uh, KB Radio News will have an expanded news report, a wrap-up of everything that's going on at 545. That's exactly 35 minutes from right now, and I'll also have a complete list of schools that will be closed on Monday. This week at Cabbages, all the hottest hits are on Super Sale. Listen, now at $3.99, Gary Wright, Light of Smile. Manfred Man Blinded by the Light. Leon Redbone, Double Time. Rod Stewart's Tonight's the Night. $3.99 for ABBA featuring Dancing Queen. Emmy Lou Harris, Luxury Liner. Gene Lapani, Imaginary Boy. $3.99 for the Ohio Players Greatest Hits. Genesis, Wind and Wuthering. And on and Just on. $3.99 for the hottest hits. Plus, now in stock, the new David Bowie, Low. A $7.98 list, now just $4.99 at Cabbages. Plus Streisand and Christofferson, A Star is Born, an $8.98 list, now $5.99. These are but a few of the specials this week at Cabbages. Well, oh, Cabbages! The music experience, Cabbages! The music experience! If there isn't a Cabbages near you, get, get moving! <laughs> No matter where you live, you can have a free Florida vacation for two. Four days and three nights at a glamorous Florida oceanfront hotel. Yours free with the purchase of any new or used car from a participating dealer. Hurry. Free vacations are limited and available only at Colonial Ford, Niagara Street, Tonawanda, Mid-City Dodge, Walden Avenue, Cheektowaga, Manorina Motors, Delaware Avenue in Tonawanda, Delaware Motors for Volvo and Subaru, Delaware Avenue, Buffalo, and Ray Wiles Chevrolet, Millersport Highway. Free Florida vacations while they last. George Hamburger. Well, again, if you're in your car and you're out on the Niagara section of the thruway or you're stranded wherever you are, don't be afraid. Just relax. This is a great adventure. <laughs> Miserable adventure, but you can tell your grandchildren about it. And you'll survive it if you just relax. And there are state police and law enforcement officials whose job it is to get to you, and they're working on that right now, and they'll do it, too. Ordered by February 9th for delivery later, or bought from stock by February 28th, 1977. Also, this offer now applies to new Chevrolet Series 5 Love trucks bought from stock by February 28th, 1977. You get the cash bonus no matter how good a deal you get from your Chevrolet dealer. Here's a look at the weather for Rochester, and it's not good. It's 3 degrees currently, minus 16 Celsius. There's a blizzard warning continuing for tonight. Westerly winds at 20 to 45 miles an hour with higher gusts at times will produce near zero visibility in blowing and drifting snow. Winds will diminish to 15 to 30 tomorrow. Bitterly cold with snow tapering off to flurries and possible local squalls tonight. Accumulation 2 to 4 inches overnight. Below 5 to 10 below zero. Continued windy and cold with occasional flurries likely Saturday, Saturday night and Sunday, with a high tomorrow near 5 above and the low tomorrow night about zero. The high Sunday, 10 to 15 degrees. And the chance of snow is put at 80% tonight, 70% tomorrow, and 60% tomorrow night. It's 3 degrees in Rochester, minus 16 Celsius. That's the news. I'm Dick DeMecco. Well, Dick, the 5 o'clock news was brought to you by Chevrolet and your local Chevrolet dealer, who also bring you Motor Trend's Car of the Year, the new Chevrolet Caprice Classic. This is Dick Pavada, the voice of Snow Ridge Ski Resort in Turn, New York, bringing you our ski conditions as of Friday morning, January 21st, and a forecast of the weather conditions we expect over the weekend. Well, the word is snow this morning. Lots of it on our 20-inch base. We've had a foot of snow in the last week, and our big cats are out right now grooming the slopes. Conditions are really excellent for the weekend, and when we say excellent, we mean excellent. Most of us are glad to see a pleasant warming trend. Our weatherman, Liv Lansing, tells us we can expect some warmer weather with temperatures in the 20s and a chance of snow flurries throughout the weekend. Now and then I take a little survey riding one of the lifts and ask someone why they ski Snow Ridge. Good snow conditions is a frequent answer. And then people often add, you know, it kind of seems that I have more fun at Snow Ridge. This is Dick Favada for Snow Ridge Ski Resort in Turin, New York, where the fun's at.
Take through way 50, exit 50 through exit 55 is closed. And the Niagara section of the throughway is closed, plus the Grand Island bridges are closed. And life is pretty tedious. Just occurs to me that we have a bunch of vehicles here sitting out in front of our radio station here on Elmwood Avenue. And a lot of folks are, are wandering around their vehicles and everything else. And if you folks are cold, you might as well bop on in here. Because we got, if one thing, we got plenty of heat for the time being anyway. All right? Okay, keep that in mind. Okay, now we'll check out some other cancellations for you and closings and all that other stuff. In just a moment at 93 WBEN, stand by. Charlie, what are you so happy about? Well, I'm thinking about my trip to Rome. Arriva Derci Roma. I'll fly from Buffalo to New York, then Al Italia 747 jet to Rome with great Italian food on the plane. Mamma mia, seven days in Rome. Beautiful. The Coliseum, the Forum, the Via Veneto, sidewalk cafes, and I'll be staying at the Savoy Hotel. Great. When you leaving, Charlie? March 17th, St. Patrick's Day. I hope. You hope? Yeah, I haven't won the trip yet. You mean you expect to win a vacation like that? Come on! Sure, it's called OTB's Roman Holiday for two, so I put my free entry in at OTB. I didn't have to buy anything. They'll draw the winner on February 28th, and I think I'm going to win. A positive thinker, that's me. Charlie, you have a great idea. Excuse me. Where are you going, Pat? To OTB, Charlie. Where else? Arrivederci, Roma. <laughs> You see, I figure you don't have to be a Roman to win a trip to Rome. Okay, we are monitoring the Buffalo Amateur Radio Repeaters Association, and uh, we have been uh, told that Sheridan Drive is just a big parking lot. <laughs> and uh, north of Youngman at 290 is backed up. And again, guys, I remind you, Niagara County is in a state of emergency if you're on the air or if you're on the road there. Uh, you're going to be in violation. It's open for emergency vehicles only. Uh, Mike Slepian is uh, downtown, and Michael, I, I have a feeling that you'll probably be listening, and, and I wonder if in the next couple of minutes you can come up and give us a report on what the uh, conditions downtown might be through the Buffalo Amateur Radio Repeaters Association. Okay, we'll, we'll uh, be monitoring that. All right, let's go to Lou Douglas in WBEN Newsroom. Uh, this is Lou Douglas in the WBEN Newsroom. I hope to be talking to Mayor Stanley Mikowski. Uh, he has a special announcement. We haven't got the mayor. All right, thank you. Uh, the information from the mayor's office is, and we will have the mayor on the phone, is that Mayor Mikowski has requested, or rather has received word from Governor Kerry that uh, he has requested President Carter to declare Buffalo in a state of emergency and make it available for federal funds. We hope to have Mayor Mikowski on the phone. We just received that news in the WBEN newsroom. Okay, Lou, thank you so much. Mayor Mikowski expecting to uh, have the uh, President of the United States declare Buffalo a state of emergency, and that would make it available for federal funds that would help us with the cleanup after all this takes place. Attention all employees, Harrison Radiator Division, Lockport and Buffalo Plants. Due to weather conditions, second and third shifts have been canceled for today. Friday, January 28th, normal operations will resume on Monday unless employees are otherwise notified. An important message from National Fuel Gas. All residential customers are urged to turn their thermostats back 65 degrees by day, 55 degrees at night. All stores, offices, and commercial buildings must have temperatures of 55 degrees at all times. It is urgent because weather forecasters predict continued sub-zero temperatures through Monday. We must save more gas now to prevent prolonged closings. Set home thermostats 65 degrees by day, 55 degrees at night. Commercial buildings 55 degrees at all times. We have other cancellations that are continuing to stream in, and I'll get them to you as quickly as I can. Attention Buffalo Evening News readers and carriers. Because of the storm, no home delivery of tonight's edition of the Buffalo Evening News. Repeat, no home delivery of tonight's edition of the Buffalo Evening News. And we'll get to the cancellations right after this. A few months ago, upstate milk cooperatives introduced Western New York to Nutrish, the new milk with a new benefit. How's Nutrish doing? Here's what Mrs. Nancy Smith of Hamburg told us. My son, Jeffrey, is 16 months old. He's always had an allergic problem to milk, and his formula that he was on was getting more and more expensive and harder to find. Then I heard about Nutrish. He hasn't had any bad reactions to it. The doctors feel that it's taken the place of formula very well. Oh, 2 o'clock this afternoon when I went on the air. 
Um, the, uh, the whole problem with Niagara County right now is absolute snow. Snowing, blowing, drifting, dangerous. We talked about a nurse before that uh, is a registered nurse. And if I can find that out, I'd like to keep these separate if possible. Um, can you thumb through there and see if you can find uh, the uh, registered nurse? I have another registered nurse at a different location who is kind enough to call in 2918 McCoon Avenue. Anyone in that area who may require medical help should give her a call. All right, we're uh, we're moving right along as best we can. Uh, let's let me start passing some along some of these things along to you so that we can kind of catch up. All right, we have a blood mobile on a blood run to Mercy Hospital, disabled at South Park Avenue and Hamburg Street. Now we are taking these things as they come and uh, you know as they show some priority. Although the University of Buffalo Law School is closed, the Marine Bar Review course will be held on schedule at 6 p.m. at the law school. You got to be kidding me. Well, I guess that's what they're going to do. All right, uh, Skajakwita District Scout Dinner Dance at the uh, Townhouse Restaurant scheduled for tomorrow night is canceled until further notice. The William Hengera Company offering sanctuary for downtown stranded persons who need shelter and food. We had that a little while ago. They expect to be open all night, and uh, they will be closed Saturday and Sunday, but hopefully they will reopen Monday at the regular time.